Am I coming through? Beautiful. Uh, welcome to Double Black Diamond. This is an expert level class, but everybody's welcome. I'm happy that we have a huge uh, group of people here tonight to check out this logical reasoning only class. Uh, we have an ad agenda that's been pre-made for us. We've got nine logical reasoning questions. It usually takes me about 90 minutes <clears throat> to do nine logical reasoning questions in classes and uh, feel like I've answered at least some of your questions. Today, I have lots of help with me. I can see Eric is here from LSAT Demon. I can see Abigail is here from LSAT Demon. And I think Callie is also here from LSAT Demon, although I do not see Callie. Is she in the room? Maybe it's just, uh, there's so many faces tonight. Um, thanks for having your cameras on. Love to see who's here. I can, believe it or not, I, I can kind of get a lot, a lot of information from you if you're just nodding along or shaking your head or uh, whatever. I can get a lot of information there. The chat is wide open. People are saying hi to each other over there. I recommend that you put questions in the chat. And you can also, at any time during class, you can send direct messages to Abigail or Eric or Callie if she's around. Um, and any of those three can help you out. Did anybody else uh, show up, Eric or Abigail? Helper wise? I think it's just us for now. Just us for now. Okay, cool. Um, they can answer your questions about LSAT demon subscriptions and what it's like to study for with the demon and just random questions that aren't related to uh, the actual LSAT content. I'm also going to hope to hear from some of you. Uh, I'm going to ask you to use the raise hand feature in Zoom. If you use the raise hand feature, you can queue up and I will try to call on you. But Double Black Diamond, being an expert level class, uh, usually goes at a pretty quick pace. We're doing nine logical reasoning questions. They're all going to be like average or harder than average difficulty. And I'm going to try to talk you through the kind of conversation that I have with the test when I'm attacking these questions. So the way we're going to do it is by demonstration first, and then you guys can ask questions. Um, I'm not going to give you time to work on the questions in class. Uh, you're going to have to just follow along with me as I read them. Uh, if you do want time to work on the questions, you could always watch this class in the future. We record and post all of our classes within 24 hours if you want to make sure that you can have time to work on the questions and then um, watch the video. That's totally cool. So if anybody wants to just leave right now, um, I don't blame you. That's total. That's fine. Uh, otherwise, it should be fun. We're going to um, uncover all kinds of different LSAT concepts as we go. Our theory of logical reasoning at LSAT Demon is that we don't focus on question types first. We just attack the argument. If I can teach you how to properly attack these arguments, then yeah, question matters, but we get to the question after we have figured out what's good or bad about the argument itself. So hopefully um, I, I will be able to demonstrate that uh, throughout the class. It is really important that you ask questions. Please don't suffer in silence. If you're totally confused and need help, again, please hit up Eric and Abigail. They'll be also posting lots of helpful resources in the chat throughout the class. Uh, so please check out those resources as we go. And with that, oh, and Callie. Callie is here. Yes. Hi, Callie. Okay, fantastic. So if you go three three TAs that you can talk to, they're all LSAT teachers at the Demon. They're all former Demon students, actually, and LSAT teachers, uh, and they know how to do it our way, and it's it's fun, actually. So let's get started with a real question, and then see if that uh, uh, prompts any questions from you. Test 78, section one, question 11, first question on the syllabus. Modest amounts of exercise can produce a dramatic improvement in cardiovascular health. Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, I that seems unobjectionable. I think, you know, in real life, we all know that that's probably true. All right. One should exercise most days of the week, but one need only do the equivalent of half an hour of brisk walking on those days to obtain cardiovascular health benefits. 
one should exercise most days of the week. That doesn't seem objectionable to me. I think I've heard that. I think there's a lot of people who try to exercise every single day. Uh, one need only do the equivalent of half an hour of brisk walking on those days and you're gonna get cardiovascular health benefits. Great. Now that doesn't say that you're going to get like maximum possible cardiovascular health benefits. They're just telling you that if you do uh, most days of the week, half an hour of brisk walking or the equivalent, you uh, will have some cardiovascular health benefits. More vigorous exercise is more effective. So, you know, brisk walk, that's great. If you could do a jog instead or a sprint, uh, maybe better but a strenuous workout is not absolutely necessary, which, okay, because you just told me that if I do the equivalent of half an hour of brisk walking most days, then you are gonna be getting cardiovascular health benefit. Not that you're gonna be like Mr. You know, immediate Ironman triathlon or whatever, but you will get some health benefit. So it's not strictly necessary that you really work out strenuously. All right, fine. At least not for cardiovascular health benefit. All right, fine. Nothing there really objectionable. So there's not an argument here, right? This isn't evidence and then some conclusion that's not really justified by the evidence. Rather, this is just a bunch of evidence. So I think they're probably just gonna say, hey, which one of these, probably just gonna be like a must be true question. Let's see, which one of the following is most strongly supported by the statements above? Well, yeah, so I, I figured that out there. I knew that you know they, they weren't really doing any logic. They were just presenting me a bunch of facts. And then they say, okay, so which one of these is proven by those facts? It's really just a reading comprehension question in disguise. Uh, on reading comp, almost all the questions are just a bunch of must be trues. Uh, and this is no exception. You know, which one of these do we feel like we have evidence for? Which one can we prove? The other four, I should probably be able to figure out how, how they're not provable. Like this is the one I can prove. And then these other four, nah, you can't prove those. Let's see. A, having a strenuous workout most days of the week can produce a dramatic improvement in cardiovascular health. Well, look, I know that if you only do the equivalent of half an hour of brisk walking on most days of the week, you will be getting cardiovascular health benefits. A says, oh, and then I also know that more vigorous exercise is more effective. So then does that not seem to support the idea that if you have a more strenuous workout on the on the same schedule most days of the week, strenuous workout, then that can produce a dramatic improvement in cardiovascular health. Yeah, sure. I mean, I don't know what dramatic means, but I know that it's more than you would if you just did walking. And I know that walking is enough to give you cardiovascular benefits. Uh, you could probably make a good argument that any cardiovascular benefits are dramatic benefits, given how important it is. So I don't really see A as objectionable. Probably that's going to be the answer. Let me see if I can eliminate B, C, D, E. Because the wrong answers are wrong. The wrong answers are not second best. The wrong answers are wrong. So B, doing the equivalent of half an hour of brisk walking two or three times a week generally produces dramatic improvements in cardiovascular health. No, because I know that you get some improvement from half an hour most days of the week, B's like, oh, well, but if we're, what if we only do two or three days a week? That's not most days. Most days is four. Uh, two or three is not most. That's less than most. And so I have no idea that that's going to give you any improvement, let alone a dramatic improvement, whatever that means. B's out. C, it is possible to obtain at least as great an improvement in cardiovascular health from doing the equivalent of half an hour of brisk walking most days of the week as from having a strenuous workout most days of the week no more vigorous exercise is more effective so yeah a walk works a walk gives you some benefit if you do it most days of the week but more vigorous exercise is more effective so i can't vouch for this idea that you're going to get the at least as great of a cardiovascular improvement if you just do the walking than if you did a more strenuous workout? No, C is, you know, it's proven wrong by the facts on the page that more vigorous exercise is more effective. D, aside from exercise, there's no way of improving one's cardiovascular health. There's no evidence at all for that. We do know that exercise helps, but you know, quitting smoking, eating a better diet, meditating, sleeping better, there could be a thousand other things that help your cardiovascular health. 
E, to obtain a dramatic improvement in one's cardiovascular health, one must exercise strenuously, at least occasionally. No, I know that I can improve my cardiovascular health somewhat if I do the equivalent of half an hour of brisk walking most days of the week. Maybe if I did it every day, nothing strenuous, but every day, half an hour of brisk walking might be enough to give me a dramatic improvement in one's cardiovascular health, whatever that means. The facts do support the idea though, since strenuous, uh, sorry, since vigorous exercise is more effective and since walking works, then yeah, doing something strenuous most days of the week should produce a bigger improvement. It's the only answer I can possibly pick. Is it strictly must be true? No, I don't think that A is proven to be true by the facts that we were given but we're asked for the one that is most strongly supported by the statements above, not strictly which one can we prove. And if I had to vouch for any of these, like stand up in court and go, well, yes, your honor, the record, the record points to this, the record supports this, I would have to pick A. There's big problems with B, C, D, E. They are all demonstrably wrong. And the answer is A. All right, Eric, Abigail, Callie, are you getting blown up with questions? Yes, from Eric. Abigail, yes. Here's a here's a good one that I saw in the chat earlier. Um, okay. Someone someone was considering A, but then thought, nah, too easy. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is really common. Uh, it, it happens more and more as you get better at the LSAT. The LSAT is easy. Ben and I are working on a book called The LSAT is Easy. Um, this is a, supposedly a level five question. I don't feel that this is a level five question, but that means that it's among the 20% or so of the most commonly missed questions in our database, which is all of the questions, you know, 5,000, whatever questions. Um, if you click, can I just share it? This might be a little awkward, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I just want everybody to know, because you guys can already do this, okay? So I'm sharing my screen with you here. This is demon drilling. When you've selected an answer uh, and submitted it, if you're right, it turns it green. If you're wrong, it does not turn the correct answer <laughs> colors because we want you to try it again without knowing what the correct answer is. Uh, but when you get it right, it's like, yeah, you got it right. It also shows you how many people, that's the shaded area is showing you how many people chose that answer. So with C, you can see that that's the most commonly chosen answer. Um, I'm kind of surprised how often people pick it because it is demonstrably uh, wrong. We just do not know that you're going to get as least a, as least a gr an, as great an improvement if you only do the walking as, as if you do something more strenuous. Um, again, the reason why C is wrong is because more vigorous exercise is more effective. Uh, <laughs> What the thing I really wanted to show you though is our explanation. So if you click this little guy up here, it uh, opens up all of the explanations for you. And you can see that here we have an old classroom video from me. The thing I just did will be there soon. Uh, within a day or two, that video will be up with a brand new explanation. We're always making new explanations at the Demon. But we've also got this full written explanation, which features uh, a question from a student and then the response to that, it's a lengthy, like thorough explanation of the question. And then we've also got an older, uh, another video here from Ben. So I just wanted to point out that with your demon free account, you have access to all these questions. You also have access to copious resources to help you fully understand all of these questions. Please ask questions in the chat. Ask Eric, Abigail, Callie right now during class. But anytime after class, I want you guys to take full advantage of the demon free accounts that you already have. Uh, also, by the way, welcome if uh, basic and premium subscribers are here alongside our regular live subscribers who uh, go to multiple live classes with us seven days a week. Anyway, welcome to everybody. Okay, I'll stop my screen share now and we will get back on with it. I trust that Eric, Abigail, Callie, you're gonna flag me if there's anything in the chat that I need to address. Otherwise, I'm gonna keep moving. To 78, section one, question 14. An ethicist says, the general principle, if one ought 
to do something, then one can do it. Does not always hold true. My response to that is basically, yeah, no shit. In fact, since when was that a general principle? I mean, apparently people believe that that's a general principle, that if you ought to do something, then you can do it. No. Aren't there things we can't do? I mean, like, I don't know. There's like, I should be nicer. But can I? I don't know. Or, um, yeah, I should be better at learning people's names. But can I? I don't, I don't know. People need to smoke, stop smoking, or they need to stop drinking, or they need to stop doing, you know, heroin or whatever. They need to, they ought to, but, but can they? So I read that and I go, wow, ethicist, that is a strange thing to even propose as a general principle. But now I guess I'm going to agree with you because you're saying that it doesn't always hold true because I don't think it holds true lots of times. But anyway, let's hear you. Probably that's your conclusion and you're probably going to make an argument now in, in favor of that conclusion. So you say, this may be seen by considering an example. Yes, an example is one type of evidence. So they're, pro they're providing here evidence in favor of the sentence that they said first, which was, again, this general principle does not always hold true. So they're trying to prove that it's not true that if you ought to do something, you can do it. Okay, well, then show me disproof, right? I'm looking for now a counter example to that principle. Is that what this is? A counter example to the principle? It says, suppose someone promises to meet a friend at a certain time, but because of an unforeseen traffic jam, it's impossible to do so. They're not idiots, okay? We can't presume them to be idiots. They make bad arguments, but they're not idiots. So we have to make sense of their argument before we can then answer questions about their argument. You can't just let your eyes glaze over and go, oh my God, I don't understand what you're saying right now. You have to go, let me see if I can understand what you're trying to say. So they think that this idea that, you know, the, the traffic jam example, you said you're going to meet your friend, but now it's impossible because of a traffic jam. You're saying that that disproves the idea that if you ought to do something, you can do it. So the missing piece there is this idea that you ought to meet your friend that you promised to meet. At a minimum, this ethicist is assuming that if you promise to meet your friend, you generally should keep that promise. Then we follow through with their, what they think is a counter example, which is, well, yeah, because if you promise to meet your friend, you ought to meet your friend. But then if it's impossible, well, then that's an example of if you ought to do it, then you can being false. That's what they're trying to disprove. Uh, you could find an objection here which is you're assuming that I ought to meet my friend even if it became impossible, like circumstances beyond my control and it became impossible to do it. Well, then aren't we just arguing about semantics? Because you're saying that I still ought to, even though I can't. And that disproves the idea that if you ought to do something, you can do it. But isn't it equally sensible to just say, oh, well, you know, if it becomes impossible, then obviously you no longer ought to do that thing. Anyway, which one of the following is an assumption required by the ethicist's argument? Now, this is a must-be-true question. Necessary assumption questions and must-be-true questions are basically the same thing. Uh, on a must-be-true question, it's just which one can we prove. On a necessary assumption question, it's which one can we prove this ethicist believes. So there's evidence in the passage to support the idea that this ethicist thinks, A, if a person failed to do something she or he ought to have done, then that person failed to do something that she or he promised to do. You know, I wouldn't actually spend very much time trying to decipher that because 
answers are wrong uh, 80% of the time. So when I read a confusing, notice how that answer is really long, it's really wordy, it's confusing. I When I first read it, I go, well, it sounds backward to me because I thought you were saying that if you don't keep a promise, then you that's you're failing to do something that you ought to have done. And instead, A says, if you fail to do something you ought to have done, then you have failed to, to keep a promise. But aren't there other things maybe that I should do that I ought to do that I didn't promise to do? So A seems backward to me. Next answer. B, only an event like an unforeseen traffic jam could excuse a person. Nope, I'm done there. I don't need to read any more of that answer. Um, they gave the traffic jam as an example. That was a, a purported counterexample to this principle that they're trying to disprove. And B, there's no way that only a traffic jam would be the only thing that would ever do anything because it was just an example. I see someone asking in the chat if we should diagram questions. Absolutely not. Diagramming hurts most students. It does not help students. Uh, if you can do the diagram correctly, you could just do it in your head. And if you uh, can't do the diagram correctly, then it's wasting time and causing you to maybe miss the question anyway. So uh, we do not teach diagramming for any logical reasoning questions. We keep it simple. Um, see if there's something that a person ought not do. Okay, I'm not gonna read that answer any further either. Remember, answers are wrong 80% of the time. I'm looking for one that I think I can prove. C is about a different thing. I thought we were talking about things that you ought to do. C is now talking about things that we ought not do. Like ought to do is call your grandmother. Ought not do is shoplift from the 7-Eleven. I, I didn't think we were talking about crimes. I thought we were talking about things you ought to, meeting your friend for lunch, for example. D, the obligation created by a promise is not relieved by the fact that the promise cannot be kept, yes. I can prove that based on this record. This speaker has taken a position that their uh, traffic jam counter example disproves the idea that if you ought to do something, then you can do it. That means they have to agree that the obligation to meet your friend is not relieved by the impossibility of meeting your friend. Because if it were, if the obligation were relieved, then you no longer ought to do that thing, then it's no longer a counterexample to uh, that purported principle, the principle that the author is trying to disagree with. So the author has to believe that, e, that D is true. That's going to be the answer. Let me just make sure I can get rid of E. If an event like an unforeseen traffic jam interferes with someone's keeping a promise, <laughs> then that person shouldn't have made the promise to begin with. We're not talking about like whether it's good or, you know, be careful what promises you make is not the lecture that this ethicist is trying to give us. This ethicist set out to try to disprove a very specific proposition, which is if you ought to do something, you can. They offered this counterexample. And in order for that counterexample to remain a counterexample, they must believe that D is true. That's why the answer is D. Layla, we don't really teach the negation test on necessary assumption questions anymore. I used to. Way back in the day, I used to teach necessary assumption uh, negation. I think it confuses people more than it helps them. But basically, it's just, hey, if D is false, what happens? If D is false, does it kill the ethicist's argument? And yes, it does. Uh, the negation test technically works. I just don't really find value in teaching it because I think that it, it causes people to waste time and misunderstand. For example, if you start with the negation test, it's super, it's super confusing. For one thing, right? You're already asking me probably the thing that's confusing is that there's a not in D. So then how do like, what happens there? Do I add a not to negate it or do I take the not away? What happens if there's a double negative? Then how do I negate it? So we, we steer away from teaching the negation test when we talk about necessary assumption questions. I think it'll be a lot easier for you if you just treat necessary assumption questions as if they are must-be-trues. Awesome. Can I ask a question? Go for it. Oh, what I, I'll let Hadari ask a question. Hadari. Hey, sorry. Um, I got... I got D wrong, or I got this question wrong. 
Yeah. I, I see how you need D to be true um, in order for the example to be, like, for the example to be valid. I just understood it like the end goal of the ethicist, right, is to prove that D isn't correct. Am, right. I, am I wrong on that? No. No, the end goal of the ethicist is to prove that this general principle is incorrect. The general principle was if one ought to do something, then one can do it. That's what they're trying to uh, disprove. Uh, okay, yes, yes. That's their conclusion. The first sentence is their conclusion. If one ought to. Um, so if you're not relieved with the fact, publishing people in Thomas is not. Okay. Okay, I got it. Thank you very much. Uh, Eric. I just wanted to point out the uh, that Abigail linked to a article on why we try to resist diagramming on LR, but that question was asked maybe a quick overview of why you're not trying to diagram this question. Because it it takes time and anyway, what would I diagram? I mean, why why are we diagramming? I would only find any diagramming useful if it was a chain of conditional reasoning, like if this, then that, if that, then this other thing, if the other thing, then the other thing, okay? Um, it, then maybe I would write like a, a, a cause, like try to arrange the argument with causal links. Uh, an example of that is just um, if you're at Disneyland, then you're in Orange County. And if you're in California, you're in the United States. And if you're in um, Orange County, you're in California. And so so then if I had these links of if, you know, th then I might arrange it as, okay, so Disneyland, Orange County, California, United States. Okay, I get it. I get the chain that you're trying to build, but with this argument, I mean, one, I don't even do that if there is a, a conditional chain because it takes too much time. And if I can't understand it in my head, you know, it's only three sentences or whatever. If I can't understand that in my head, I don't think I'm going to really be able to understand it period. And then the other thing is students misapply it all the time because students, they see the word if here and they go, okay, I better start diagramming it because this looks like a conditional. Yeah. There's one conditional, but then it doesn't link to anything else. So if you diagram it, what the hell are you even diagramming? Um, let's see, can I get a question from Anne-Marie? Hello, I had a follow-up from the last question. Go. Oh. Um, I was wondering, so the ethicists, the, the first principle, were saying that, it, that it's correct or that he or she believes that it exists in general. And then the counterexample can exist only because the principle exists. Now, the ethicist assumes that people believe this when he, when he or she or whatever says the general principle. Mm -hmm. so they're assuming that like, yeah, people believe this. But mm -hmm. that's not their argument. Their argument is that it does not always hold true. What yeah. doesn't hold true? Well, the principle. Okay, what's the principle? The principle is if one ought to do something, then one can do it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So the conclusion of the argument is that that principle is false. Mm -hmm. Or that it doesn't always hold true, I guess. That's the right. The entire okay. first sentence is their conclusion. Yes. Oh, wait. Yeah. That, yeah, I see that. But then I guess I don't see, like completely how the answer is D other than by how the ethicist is just making stating the assumption is that the principle exists but not that he or she agrees with it well the no, I mean, D doesn't, D's not, a, D, D isn't saying, well, you're assuming that this principle exists. That's not what D says. D says, you're assuming that 
if an impossibility occurs, it does not automatically relieve our obligation to keep promises. Because if it did, then your purported counterexample would no longer be a counterexample because it wouldn't be something that you ought to do but can't do. It would no longer be something that you ought to do. If the obligation were relieved, then you no longer ought to do it. So now what are we, why are we even talking about these impossible circumstances? I okay. hope that helps. If not, please uh, so. talk to, great. Yeah. Talk to Eric, talk to Abigail, maybe more resources coming at you in the chat. Can I get one more question from Aberal and then I'm going to move on. We're, we're expected to, from the answer choices, prove and agree with the ethicist saying just because it's unforeseen traffic jam, that means that it's on you because you made the promise, even if it's impossible to do. According to them, result. otherwise their counterexample and makes no sense anymore. That's And that's what I'm trying to say, like in terms of these, like, oh, just because you made the promise, it's on you to hold it, doesn't matter if you got it right or wrong. The ethicist must believe that because otherwise, why are they even bringing up these impossible circumstances? All right, thank yeah. you. Cool. Thanks everybody for your questions. I know that I kind of might seem a little bit mean or intimidating or whatever, but I really do want your questions. I, I want to hear from you. I This stuff is easy if you let it be easy. By the way, um, so, so keep your questions coming because I'm glad you guys expect to be able to understand. That's a big part of this is like, hey, I'm a good reader. I read this carefully. I expect to be able to understand this. If you can't do that, you're not gonna have a good time like in, law school and beyond, you know, you need to be the person who just like, I am going to hang in there and I am going to get this stuff. So thank you for your questions. Um, all right, I'm going to keep moving. Test 78, section one, question 16. In most of this forest, the expected outbreak of tree eating tussock moths should not be countered. Okay. So that's probably the conclusion of their argument. You know, they're, they, they're starting off by telling people what they should do. So I immediately start trying to think about the counter argument. The LSAT logical reasoning is much easier and much more fun if you learn to try to call bullshit on what they're saying. So they say something that sounds like trying to boss somebody else around. I immediately go, well, but what if my client is the uh, Department of Agriculture and the Department of Agriculture wants to counter this outbreak of tree-eating tussock moths, because if not, it'll wipe out uh, the almond crop. I don't know. Almonds are big money. There's They got big lawyers behind them. They do. Uh, okay, after all, it says. So that means, yeah, here comes evidence. You don't say after all, unless you just said your conclusion and you're about to say the evidence for that conclusion. After all, the moth is beneficial where suppression of forest fires, for example, has left the forest unnaturally crowded with immature trees and blank. Okay, thinking about it from this objecting point of view, Right Again, my almond farming clients, they want to stop this outbreak. And you say, well, it's beneficial where suppression of forest fires, for example, meaning there could be other things, has left the forest unnaturally crowded with immature trees. I immediately start looking for evidence that this forest, that my client wants to just douse with, you know, Agent Orange to kill off the tree eating tussock moths. I immediately start looking for evidence that the forest is not unnaturally crowded with immature trees. Sorry. Yes, is not unnaturally crowded with immature trees. I forgot who whose team I was on for a second. Um, then I look at my bank account and I realize, oh yeah, the almond farmers, they paid me. They're the ones that want to nuke the forest. I know that this uh, the moth is beneficial where the forest fires or other things have left the forest unnaturally crowded with immature trees. But if I can prove that this is not one of those areas, then your argument falls apart. Now, 
the and blank would indicate that they were about to provide some more evidence, right? So what stops me from making my objection is they say, and this is one of those areas. That would be great. That would make their argument a lot better. If I'm the, the almond farmer's attorney, then I hope that that's not what they say here because I want to keep a fighting chance. But if that is what they say here, then, you know, it strengthens their case against the idea that we should counter this particular outbreak. outbreak. The conclusion of the argument is most strongly supported if which one of the following completes the passage. So yeah, I'm not surprised. It turns out to be just a strength in question. I knew that going in when I, by the way, there is no fill in the blank question type. It's hilarious when people talk about a fill in the blank question type because half of those questions are uh, must be trues and half of these questions are strengthened questions and strengthened and must be true are completely different question types. So if you think there is such a thing as a fill in the blank question type and you struggle with them, yeah, it's because you're missing that there are two entirely different question types nested within that one. So um, yeah, this is gonna be called a strengthened question. And it says, the conclusion of the argument is most strongly supported if which one of the following completes the passage. I know that we're looking for a premise and I would like something that ties in the thing that they just said. So I'm looking for this area has an unnaturally crowded forest. It's crowded with immature trees. A, more than half of the forest is unnaturally crowded with immature trees. Don't hate it. I was looking for this forest is crowded with immature trees unnaturally so. And, you know, A only says more than half, but more than half could include like 99% or actually all because all is more than half. So anywhere between 51 and 100% of the forest, I'd prefer it was 100%, but most is pretty good. That looks like evidence. Uh, that's probably the answer because the LSAT's easy. Let me see if I can get rid of B, C, D, E. B says, mature trees are usually the first to be eaten by tussock moths. Who cares? How does that apply to this forest that my client wants to attack? A, prevents my client from attacking the forest. B, does nothing. My, my client would just go, yeah, okay, so if this forest is not unnaturally crowded with immature trees, then you have no argument whatsoever. A, patched that hole I, I'm pretty sure it's going to be A. And with every answer I eliminate, I'm going to be more and more sure that it's A. C, usually a higher proportion of mature trees than of immature ones are destroyed in forest fires. Again, I just, I don't even know whether your one premise applies to your argument. Your one premise is the moth is beneficial where there is unnaturally crowded with immature trees. I don't know if this forest is or is not. So C doesn't answer a really big objection, which A did. So I'm still on A. Uh, D, the expected outbreak of tussock moths will almost certainly occur if no attempt is made to counter it. I mean, that looks like it weakens the argument. I'm looking for something that strengthens their argument. They don't want to counter the tussock moths, right? But D says, well, it's an outbreak and it's going to definitely happen if we don't try to counter it. E, there are no completely effective countermeasures against the moth. Who cares? I, even if it's not completely effective, I still am going to want to do it, right? My almond farmer clients are, they understand that it's not going to kill 100% of the tussock moths, but if we kill 99% of the tussock moths, they might be thrilled. So who cares about E? Answer here's A because it puts the people who want to do this intervention in a tough spot. A makes the first premise that they presented at the beginning of their second sentence actually apply to the conclusion that they were trying to draw, which was about this particular forest. Another level five, uh, but honestly, like even the easy, even the hard questions on the LSAT, they really are easy if you just take this master of the argument approach. I'm going to understand what the facts say. If they're making an argument, I'm really going to dig in there and I'm going to tell them whether their facts prove their conclusion. If their facts don't prove their conclusion, then I'm going to look for wiggle room because that's where the lawyers are going to be fighting. And I do all that before I, I mess with the question and God forbid the answer choices, okay? The way we do it is not 
narrow it down to two or three and pick the best one. The way we do it is on a much higher level. Crush the argument with your understanding. See through the test. Learn how to just predict the answers. It turns hard questions into easy ones. And it's the only way in my book, it's the only way that I would ever have been able to finish a section in 35 minutes and still have high accuracy. I can't imagine brute forcing this by process of elimination. There, there are questions where I'm gonna end up using some process of elimination, but more often than not, I'm gonna have a really strong idea what kind of answer I'm looking for before I ever read A and B and C and D and E. If you're really confused about LSAT logical reasoning, it's because you're comparing wrong answers to one another instead of spending more time really unlocking that argument. Cameron, I see your comment and I, I want to point out that it might feel like it's redundant because obviously that's what they meant. Something along those lines, but they never put that in their brief. That was not part of their argument. And if that's not part of their, their like legal argument in words on the page, then it's open for debate. So when you see A and you go, well, that's, that's, that's certainly what they were saying. Well, then, yeah, let's get that in the record because otherwise it's just a missing piece. And if we make that assumption explicit, then we are strengthening the argument. Alex. Yeah, so I got this one right, but it took me a little longer than I would have wanted because I think I got it when I tied more than more than half to most of this forest. So like it framed the argument in the sense that like generally for the forest, we should do it. Like, was that a correct, like, connection no. to make? Uh, no, that I, I don't think so. I mean, what A does is it says that the the thing about the moth being beneficial, where suppression of forest fires, for example, has left the forest unnaturally crowded with immature trees. A says yes, that applies to most of this particular forest. And we're trying to make a conclusion about this particular forest. In most of this forest, the expected outbreak should not be countered. Yeah, because the moths are beneficial for most of the forest. If most it's... of this forest, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. A doesn't apply to forests generally. A applies to yeah, this yeah. particular forest. This, That's yes. how it makes this argument better. Beautiful. Yes, Aaron, we have a demon discord. Uh, TAs will help you out with that in the chat. Just a little reset. This is Double Black Diamond. Double Black Diamond is an expert level class. So far, we have done the first three uh, level five difficulty, five out of five. That's as hard as it ever gets at the Demon. Um, and I think we've made fairly easy work. That second one was maybe a little bit tough, but uh, number one and number three were pretty predictable. Um, we've got six more questions on the agenda. Happy you're here. Eric. Abigail and Callie are all here from LSAT Demon. You should be able to see them on their video and you should be able to talk to them in the chat. You can send them direct messages if you have questions at any time during the class. And lower, uh, sorry, raise your hand if you want me to call on you. I'm gonna continue uh, my journey through these questions. Test 78, section one, question 17. In order to relieve traffic congestion, the city of Gasner built a new highway linking several of the city's suburbs to the downtown area. That's in order to relieve traffic congestion, you're building a new highway linking suburbs. The older you get, the more you're going to recognize that when they build new roads, it doesn't tend to make the traffic better. <laughs> like it might at first, but then it also has a way of making the traffic worse in the long run. Um, anyway, they, they built a new highway. I, I wonder how that worked out for them. Did they achieve their goal of uh, relieving traffic congestion? Uh, I guess not. However, it says the average commute time for workers in downtown Gasner 
increased after the new highway opened. So specifically for people in the downtown area, their average commute time uh, increased after this new highway was open. What was this new highway doing again? Oh, it was linking several suburbs to the downtown. I mean, it doesn't take rocket science. My idea here is, it, is it possible that like when they built these this new highway that connected all the suburbs to the downtown, that then people decided to use that highway and drive downtown because that's what the new highway linking the suburbs to downtown is for. So they thought, oh, it's going to relieve traffic congestion. And you know what? Maybe on the side streets leading between the suburbs or between the suburbs and downtown. But if everyone then is just on the freeways downtown, then maybe the traffic gets horrendous downtown. And that is exactly what happens when you build more roads is you get more cars. Um, so it's not doesn't seem like a mystery to me. Which one of the following, if true, most helps to explain the increase in average commute time? Uh, well, we're just looking for the one that makes this make sense. You know, you built a new highway, but it increased uh, commute times. Uh, I'm just imagining downtown any city uh, jam-packed with cars from the suburbs. It doesn't seem like it's that much of a mystery here. Um, okay, so does A explain this mystery? Most people who work in the downtown area of Gassner commute from one of the city's suburbs. Not, not really. Um, you know, they built the highway to alleviate to, to relieve traffic congestion, A, saying, well, you know, most people who work downtown come from the suburbs. I would go, but why didn't the highway uh, relieve traffic congestion? A doesn't explain it. A, A still just makes me go, yeah, but why didn't it relieve the traffic congestion? I need an answer that's gonna help me to understand why this didn't work. B, the location of the new highway is most convenient for people who commute to and from Gassner's largest suburbs. Who cares? I'm assuming that these people came from the suburbs. What I want to know is why the average commute time for workers went up when you built the new highway. A and B aren't explaining it. C, shortly after the new highway was opened, several suburban roads connecting to the new highway were upgraded with new stoplights. Yeah, but new stoplights might be more efficient, not less efficient, right? If there was already just like some stop sign there or uh, like a terribly functioning old uh, stoplight, it might have had bad timing on it, for example, and that might have made the situation worse. The new stoplights, stoplights could have made it better, right? D, at the same time the new highway was being built, road repair work was being done on important streets leading to downtown Gassner. That doesn't help me understand why the new highway led to more traffic congestion. D is about what happened during uh, the, yeah, during the um, construction, not after the construction. I know that after it was already built, there was worse traffic also, road repair work, once it's done, presumably would make the traffic better. I don't know. So A, B, C, D, none of them are making me go, oh, I see. Yeah, okay, that makes sense why the situation got worse. E says, in Gassner's downtown area, traffic on the roads near the new highway became more congested after the new highway was open. Oh, well, that's exactly what I had pictured. I mean, I was imagining everybody from the suburbs getting on the freeway, blasting downtown, and then everybody's downtown. You built new highways. You didn't build new downtown roads. And so if he's true that traffic near the new highway in the downtown area became more congested, then that helps me to understand how the average commute time for workers in downtown Gassner increased. And the answer is going to be E. Fairly straightforward. That one's just a level four. 
um, out of five difficulty. Test 78, section one, question 18. An office worker says, I have two equally important projects that remain undone. Wow, okay. Uh, why? Well, the first one's late already. <laughs> okay. I wanted to know why your projects were late uh, or they're equally important and they're both undone. I wanted to know why. And now you're telling me the first one's late. And if I devote time to finishing it, then I won't have time to finish the second one before the deadline. Admittedly, there's no guarantee that I can finish the second project on time, even if I devote all my time to it. But I nonetheless, I should nonetheless devote all of my time to the second project, which makes me go, why? Why? I mean, you just said that there's no guarantee you can finish the second project on time, even if you devote all your time to it. And you've got a project that's already late. Don't we want to work on the one that's the most late? But you seem to be working under a different strategy, which is, well, one of them's already late. So then I guess you don't care if it's later because you want to work on the one that you still have some chance of uh, finishing on time. But even though, even though you can't even guarantee that. Also, you're fired. I mean, I'm not having people work for me that continue to have all these delayed projects and they're making all these excuses. But uh, anyway, why are you like, what is the policy by which you are choosing to devote all of your time to the second one? And that is what the question ends up asking. Which one of the following principles, if valid, most helps to justify the office workers reasoning? Well, I was already trying to think it through on their behalf, right? Why are you choosing the second one? Well, it must be that you think that it's a better policy if you have any chance of finishing something on time, then that's the thing you should work on. So does A, help them to decide, yes, I should devote all of my time to the second project. A, it's better to focus one's time on a single project than to split one's time between two projects. Well, A would explain why you would work on one of them, but A would not explain why you're going to work on project two. If A were the rule, then I still don't see how you're going to decide between project one and project two. I'm looking for something that really sells me on the idea of project two. B, it's better to finish one of two projects than to risk failing to finish both projects. I thought we were talking about finishing on time. I didn't think we were talking about never finishing the projects. B is like you should finish... If you can only finish one, you should try to finish one, and, but it doesn't have anything to do with time. It could, they could be, we could be much closer to completion on the first project, as far as I know. It could be like, well, it's going to take three weeks on project two, but it's only going to take one day on project one. Nonetheless, because I have a chance of getting project two done on time, I'm going to work on project two instead of working on project one. And if that's the case, then I don't see how a, a rule like C saying, well, it's or, or B rather, it's better to, no, C, it's better to finish, sorry, back to B. It's better to finish one than to risk failing to finish both. I, I didn't think we were gonna fail to finish either project. C, it's better to finish first, sorry, to finish, to first finish those projects that must be done than, to, no, 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 because it said I have two equally important projects. There's not one that is must be done and one that doesn't must be done. They're, they're equally important. So C can't help. D, it's better not to worry about having failed to finish a project on time than to allow such worry to interfere. But we're not talking about worry. I mean, I personally hope that this office worker is worried. They've got a late project on their desk. They're about to maybe have two late projects on their desk. D's like, well, don't worry about it because you don't want to let that worry interfere with finishing a competing project Still, why wouldn't I, if if D were the rule, I don't have to worry about the one that's done. Or sorry, I don't have to worry about the one that's already late, but why wouldn't I work on the one that's already late? I, I don't get it. E, it's better to attempt to finish a project on time than to attempt to finish a late project 
that does not have a higher priority, which it doesn't because these are two equally important projects. So that last caveat there that says uh, a late project that does not have a higher priority, um, that's annoying, but because I know for sure that that project two does not have, or sorry, project one does not have a higher priority than project two, it does apply to project one. So then E says, well, it's better to finish, to attempt to finish project two on time than to attempt to finish a project that's already late, as long as that doesn't have a higher priority, which I know it does not because of the first sentence. So answer here is E because that's the one that will uh, move this office worker toward finishing project uh, two to spending all their time on project two. No worry is not implied. Nothing is implied. I mean, it, you don't have to be worried. About, I mean, they already let the project be late. Apparently, maybe they're not worried about it. If they were worried, maybe it wouldn't have been late in the first place. All right, I got a click for Jordan. Anybody else? Is the light bulb coming on on some of the questions at least? Do you feel like it, you're getting some value out of being here? I hope so. Please asking. Uh, please keep asking all of your questions. Uh, again, talk to Eric, talk to Abigail, talk to Callie. I got helpers in the room. Actually, Callie maybe had to go now. Talk to Eric, talk to Abigail, and uh, they will sort you out, I promise. Thanks. I'm glad you guys are figuring it out. Morgan, the higher priority thing, just it. we know that project one and project two do not have higher priorities than one another. The only thing we know, though, is that project one's already late and project two, there is some chance of finishing it on time. So then E says, well, as long as project one isn't a higher priority, which it's not because they said they're equally important in the very first line of the argument, therefore work on the one that you have some chance of finishing on time. That's why E uh, would direct them toward working on project two. Brett, and then I'm going to do this next question. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to point out, I sort of thought of this as a cost benefit analysis question where it's just, is it more important? Do you get penalized for the, the late project that's already late being more late, or is it more important to finish the other project on time? That's how I looked at it. And so that worry was not a part of that equation. Yeah, worry was never mentioned, which is why we really can't pick D. We, we just can't assume anything about worry. We don't know if this guy's worried. We don't know if the boss is worried, the client's worried. We have no idea if anybody's worried, but they apparently think that they should spend all their time on project two. I go, how come? And E's the one that tells me how come. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Awesome. Thanks everybody for being here. I love teaching LSAT. I teach multiple times per week uh, for our live subscribers at lsatdemon.com. I hope you will give it a shot. If you try one month of our live program, I think it has a really good chance of blowing your mind completely. Um, after one month of live, you could quit, you could downgrade to a cheaper subscription, or you could keep going with the multiple live classes seven days a week. By the way, if you are subscribed to live, please don't come to multiple classes seven days a week. That's kind of insane. One class a day, you know, uh, uh, some selection of our classes, but don't sit in all of our classes all the time. We, we offer too many classes. It would be kind of crazy to come to all of them, but try us for one month. If you're prepping any other way, um, try us for one month. I think it's a pretty small investment compared to the kind of benefit that I believe you can get with us. We can, we can change your understanding of the test. We can help you to actually understand it on your own terms. That's our vision. So give us a shot for just a month. Test 78, uh, section one, question 21. Most kinds of soil contain clay and virtually every kind of soil contains either sand or organic material. 
or both. Okay, so most kinds of soil, that's 51% or more, contain clay. And virtually every kind of soil, that's more than most. I, I don't know how many uh, virtually every is, but you know, 99% maybe, uh, have sand or organic material or both. That's a very wishy-washy premise. It applies to almost all kinds of soil, but it could be that they all have sand and none of them have organic matter, or it could be that they all have organic matter and none of them have sand, uh, either or, oh, you know, or it could be that like all of them have both of those things. I have no idea what the breakdown is. Therefore, now here's the part that they're probably going to offer some bullshit because when they offer an argument, it's almost always wrong. Therefore, there must be some kind of soil that contain both clay and sand and some that contain both clay and organic material. And I immediately say, no, that is not true based on your facts. You said almost all soil has clay or sand, sorry. Almost all, virtually all soil has either sand or organic material or both. And again, I already thought this through before you reached your bullshit conclusion, because you know I'm the master of these arguments, which means that when I see evidence come in, I think about the boundaries on that evidence. And when you said that it that most uh, virtually every kind of soil contains either sand or organic material or both, I said, not so fast. You're not really telling me that much there because it could be zero sand organic material in all kinds of soil, or it could be zero organic material and it's sand every time. I just don't know where the boundaries are there on that premise. And then they say, oh, so therefore I know for sure that there are sands that are clay and sand, and there are sands that have clay and organic material. And an even bigger reason why that's bullshit, or, or I guess it's a second reason why that's bullshit, is because you only said that most kinds of soil had clay in the first place. So I think you could conclude that there are some kinds of soil. Now, you can't even conclude that there are some kinds of soil that have clay and sand, let alone, oh, and that is what you're concluding, is some. But no, you can't conclude that. You can't conclude that because I just don't know. It could be that sandy soil is always separate from clay. It could be that uh, organic material is always separate from clay. Now it can't be both. If you would have concluded that there has to be a kind of soil that contains clay and sand or clay and organic material, then I would have to give it to you because I know that almost all soil has uh, sand or organic material. And I know that most soil has clay. So then there's clearly an overlap between clay and one of sand or organic material but you're claiming an overlap between sand and clay and also organic material and clay. You can't prove that on these facts. Now, the pattern of flawed reasoning, so they're telling me, yes, there was a flaw, and I go, you know, yeah, I saw it. Uh, the pattern of flawed reasoning in which one of the following arguments above is most parallel to that in the argument above. So I'm looking for a similar thing where they're gonna say like, um, Boy. Let's say something like um, most cigarette smokers spend a significant portion of their income on cigarettes. Virtually all cigarette smokers experience uh Cancer or heart disease or both. So most of them spend a significant amount of money on cigarettes, but virtually all of them suffer from, again, heart disease or cancer or both. I, I don't think that that part is really true in real life, but just this could be, I, I'm giving premises that are parallel to the premises that were given in the argument so that I can then make a bullshit conclusion that's similar to theirs. And my conclusion is gonna be, Therefore, there must be some smokers who spend a significant amount of money and have cancer and some who spend a significant amount of money 
and have heart disease. So now I have predicted exactly the type of answer I'm looking for. Is it worth taking all that time? Well, hell yeah, it's worth taking all that time because otherwise I'm going to get in major weeds here. Look at how big the answer choices are, right? I've only been dealing with the argument itself and making sure that I'm clear about what that pattern is because otherwise I'm just going to get totally lost in answer, you know, so many words in the answer choices. I'm going to let go of these answers as soon as I know they're wrong. That will not require me to read all of the answer. It needs to have matching evidence and matching conclusion. It needs to have matching flaw. A, most pharmacies sell cosmetics. That's like most kinds of soil contain clay. So I can keep reading. Virtually every pharmacy. Now that is parallel to virtually every kind of soil. Sells shampoo or toothpaste or both. That is parallel to most soil contains sand or organic material or both. Now, in order for A to be correct, they have to reach a flawed conclusion that says, therefore, uh, there are some pharmacies that sell cosmetics and shampoo and some pharmacies that sell cosmetics and toothpaste. Is that what they say? They say, therefore, if there are pharmacies that sell two things and I'm, that's, I'm out. I'm tapping out at that if. There was no if or no conditionality at all in the conclusion of the given argument. There wasn't any if in the conclusion that I made about cigarette smokers, the, the sample argument that I made about cigarette smokers, A is gone. B, undoubtedly, most pharmacies sell cosmetics for almost all pharmacies. No, 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 no. The conclusion of the argument was not something that included most. So here with B, when they say undoubtedly most pharmacies sell cosmetics, I immediately know that the conclusion is different. And if the conclusion is that wildly different from the given argument, then it is not going to be a parallel flaw. That, that, can't, that just can't be the answer. So I'm letting go of it so quickly. And that's because I really mastered the argument before I went into the answer choices. This is where I get to go fast, is just by knowing that wrong answers are wrong and not wasting my time with them. C, uh, most pharmacies sell cosmetics. That's good. That's like most kinds of soil contain clay. Nearly all pharmacies sell shampoo or toothpaste or both. Okay, so now we're back on the right track. Now, again, it needs to say, therefore, there are some pharmacies that sell cosmetics and shampoo and some pharmacies that sell cosmetic and toothpaste. Therefore, unless there are some pharmacies, okay, that's it, I'm out. Again, A and C are both wrong because they started trying to introduce weird conditional reasoning if thens and unlesses into the conclusion of the argument. There was nothing like that in the given argument. So again, after half of C, I know it's wrong. D, virtually every pharmacy that sells shampoo also sells toothpaste. I don't think I would read that answer any further because I was looking for a premise that said, most of this group has this other characteristic. Then I wanted them to say, virtually every thing in this group has one or the other of these things. D instead is talking about virtually every pharmacy that does sell shampoo, also sells toothpaste. It's just not going to be parallel evidence. So there could be additional reasons why D turns out to be wrong, but I already know it's wrong. E, nearly all pharmacies sell either shampoo or toothpaste or both. Now, that's like the second premise in the given argument that virtually every kind of soil contains either sand or organic material or both. So A is a match so far, even though the elements are going to be slightly out of order. That's okay. The order doesn't matter. So here they're putting in the given argument, it's what their second premise was, right? Right after their first comma. And E is just starting with that type of a premise. Okay, fine. So now I'm expecting another premise about most. Uh, it's going to say like most pharmacies sell something. Yeah, therefore, since most pharmacies sell cosmetics, okay, so now they're they're wrapping their, you know, the therefore language that introduces their conclusion, but they go therefore, comma, since. So the sense is the premise. 
And then after the second comma in the second sentence, we get, there must be some pharmacies that sell both cosmetics and toothpaste and some that sell both cosmetics and shampoo. It is a perfect match. My objection to E is, hey, I get it that nearly all pharmacies sell either shampoo or toothpaste or both, but it could be that 99% of pharmacies sell shampoo and none of them sell toothpaste. If that were true, then it would still be true that nearly all pharmacies sell either shampoo or toothpaste or both, but it would show how you can't prove that just because pharmacies sell cosmetics, there must be some pharmacies that sell both cosmetics and toothpaste and some that sell cosmetics and shampoo. Because I, again, I don't know what the balance is between shampoo and toothpaste. If you say, if you stay properly critical, you end up reading not all of A before you know it's wrong, not all of B before you know it's wrong, not all of C, not all of D. And then you can read all of E and you can map it to the given argument and you can confidently pick it. This is a question 21. Questions at the end of the section tend to be harder. It's labeled a level five difficulty question in the demon, which means, yeah, it's among the 20% of hardest questions that our demon students encounter. It's also perfectly solvable because A, B, C, and D are all demonstrably different from the given argument and E just matches every single element perfectly. It's a solvable test. I want you to work towards solving these questions and knowing that you're getting it right. Nick and then Sojin. Hey there, question about B. Um, I know when we went through, we talked about how the conclusion is a little different, but I just wanted to double check a way. This was sort of how I eliminated B. I read it slightly differently. I tried to translate it in a different way. So I wanted to just make sure if this is a reasonable way to do it. It says undoubtedly most pharmacies sell cosmetics for. So I, I switched for to be because, and that's when I sort of said, all right, no, yeah, just like we said, different conclusion, but I, that's how I translated it. Is that a reasonable take sure. to change for, for to because? Well, for, because, since, they all mean the exact same thing. Because that was the supporting information to most pharmacies sell cosmetics. Well, it just means that the thing that they just said was their conclusion. Right. right. So if so, when I read that for again, it could say since, or it could it could say because. It says since mm. in E right before that premise. Um, it doesn't say anything right before that premise in the given argument, but that's okay because we knew mm. that the first thing that they said was a premise anyway. Um, but yeah, you could stop right there and you could go. Wait, that was your conclusion. Okay. Most pharmacies sell cosmetics. No, the given argument has okay. either or in it. And if you don't have that either or in the conclusion, then you just can't be making the same flaw. Right. Because that was the point where I sort of said, uh, bye bye. So no, I just wanted to exactly make sure that, the that way I did. Okay. You did it exactly Perfect. the way I did it. So, Jen. Hey, um, I just have a question on that, on the terms virtually every. So, is that like most or is that all like 51% to 99% most or like? All, I don't know what it means, actually. I, I don't know. Okay. I think virtually all, it seems to be something like 99%. But, but I, I really don't know. It, th that's, there's just, that's an open question. It's a relative term. Like, I know that most means by definition 51 to 100%. Virtually all, probably means more than 51%. Uh, it, you'd, be, you'd be making a weird argument if you were like, well, 51% of people are going to vote for the Democrat in this district. Therefore, virtually all people are going to vote for the Democrat in this district? No, right? So it's got to be more than that because there's no way anybody's going to rightly give you credit for virtually all if it really is 51%. I don't know where you can start making that argument. 90%, 95%, depends on the context, depends on how big the sample is probably. I, I really don't know. Lily, and then we're gonna move on. Um, So I understand um, the answer and the answer choices and why we picked that. But I was just wondering when you were um, like attacking the argument, um, why, the conclusion is wrong because to me it makes sense that there would be soil that contains both clay and sand and both clay nope. and organic material. Nope. Because I don't know that there is any organic material in any soil anywhere. 
their their premise said virtually all soil has sand or organic material or both mm -hmm. well but if 99 percent of all soil had sand that would satisfy that premise without there ever being any organic material not only that but even if there was organic material in some soil it's only true that most soil contains clay, which means that's only 51% or more. So there's 49% of soil that might not even have clay. And in that soil, there could be overlaps, or sorry, not overlaps. In that soil, there could be sand, there could be organic material. It could be that almost all sand has, or sorry, almost all soil has sand or organic material, but I have no idea what the percentages are. And it could, again, it could, it could be that there's only zero or 1% sand or zero or 1% organic material. And in that case, you would not be able to prove that there has to be an overlap between sand or sorry, between clay and sand and between clay and organic material. I could have proven an or there. Uh, it, in fact, yeah, if you gotcha. change yeah. in the conclusion of the argument, if you change one of those ands, uh, the, the middle one, <laughs> In the last sentence, if you change that and to an or, then the argument becomes 100% proven. Yeah, the and makes sense now. I get it. Yeah, I can prove one or the other. I can't prove both. And that's the flaw. And that's lawyer shit right there. Okay, that's the difference between an and and an or changing an argument from totally proven correct to could be wildly wrong. So... Dot your I's and cross your T's, folks. This is exactly what lawyers get paid for. Noticing that, you know, for your client, you're reading it, you're actually reading it, right? Fine tooth comb. You got to remember that the MBAs who put the deal together, they're doing business. They got to get to happy hour. They're not really that careful about the details. You're the lawyer. They're paying you because they want you to vet this shit and make sure that it's going to stand up in court. And if you don't catch that middle and there, then you've let a document go out the door that like these guys just cannot back up. And that's a problem. Yeah, order does not matter at all, uh, Alexis. Order does not matter at all uh, when you're doing parallel reasoning or parallel flaw questions. And you can stop halfway through. I stopped halfway through A and halfway through C and halfway through E, and I said, okay, you could be correct from here. Here's what you would have to say if you were gonna be correct from here. And I was able to predict the rest of E, which made it correct. I, when I tried to predict the rest of A, tried to predict the rest of C, they ended up then talking about weird shit that made it wrong. It did not match my prediction there. Eric. Uh, there's a little bit of conversation in the chat and then some questions I'm getting about answer choice B is B wrong because the word undoubtedly is too strong? Uh, no. Nope. <laughs> that ain't it. it. It's B is wrong because it does not have, it, the, the conclusion doesn't match. And that undoubtedly does not do anything. Um, the given argument had a conclusion that said there must be. So they're making an absolute conclusion and if you say there must be, or if you say undoubtedly, you're saying the exact same thing. You're saying this has to be true. So that, no, that is absolutely not why B is wrong. Anybody else? Thank you for continuing continuing to bring these things up, right? I mean, like 75% of the time, I'm going to tell you no, but that's okay because I don't want you to have misconceptions about the test. Keep bringing them up and I'll keep, I'll tell you if you're right, but I'll also tell you that that ain't it if it's not it. Aberol? Yeah, you crossed off D after reading the first sentence, which yes. I, I did too. Could you explain? Because uh, I thought I knew, but now I'm guessing again in terms of why I crossed it after reading some things. The virtually ever in the given argument was virtually... D is not saying virtually every pharmacy sells toothpaste or shampoo or both. 
it's saying virtually every pharmacy that sells shampoo also sells toothpaste. So they're giving you as a premise, a big overlap between shampoo and toothpaste. Well, I was never given any huge overlap like that in the given argument. I mean, I had a most soil contains clay, but I was never given a virtually all overlap between any two elements. So I read that and I go, well, that's just different. I mean, that's, that's a different type of, if it's a different type of evidence, then how can you make a parallel, a similarly flawed argument from there? You just can't. Thank you. All right, let's keep going. we got three more questions to crank through here. I'll try to not be too, too far over time. Test 78, section one, question 22. In 2005, an environmental group conducted a study measuring the levels of toxic chemicals in the bodies of 11 volunteers. Okay. Scientifically valid inferences could not be drawn from the study because of the small sample size. Right there, I note, you know, I was going to ask, like 11 in a sample doesn't sound very big if we're doing, uh, you know, uh, so, but then they, they clear it up for me and they say, yeah, you can't draw scientifically valid inferences from this sample size. But they say the results were interesting nonetheless. I read a report just today that did this exact same thing where they were using sample sizes that were admittedly too small and they were nonetheless drawing inferences from those results. This argument's dead in the water. You already said that the sample size is too small. Now you're gonna tell me though that your findings are nonetheless interesting? And I say, no, not to me. Because <laughs> if you can't draw a scientifically valid inference, then all you're doing is you're talking about small sample sizes. And talking about small sample sizes is boring. Anyway, okay, what stupid thing are you going to say now? Well, among the subjects tested, younger subjects showed much lower levels of PCBs. What are those? Those are toxic chemicals that were banned in the 1970s. This proves, <laughs> wait, proves you said at the beginning of your damn statement, or sorry, well, I guess it was the second sentence, but you said scientifically valid inferences cannot be drawn. Then how the hell do you prove something from that? Oh no, it proves that the regulation banning PCBs was effective in reducing human exposure to those chemicals. Really, in these 11 volunteers, where admittedly the sample was too small to draw scientifically valid inferences. The reasoning in the argument is most vulnerable to criticism on the grounds that the argument, what? <laughs> I say, as you know, the grown up in the room, I say, hey, you just told me that you were drawing inferences from too small of a sample size. Like you told me the flaw you were committing as you were committing it. A, it takes an inconsistent stance regarding the status of the inferences that can be drawn from the study. Oh, it absolutely does. Yeah, 100%, it did that. It did that. It's a problem that it did that. I can prove that they did that. And that, so that's gonna be the answer for a flaw question. I'll always tick off B, C, D, E, just make sure I can dismiss them. B, overlooks the possibility that two or more chemicals produce the same effects. Well, maybe you did, but who cares? Because you have this huge flaw, which is, telling me that it's too small of a sample and then drawing inferences from it anyway. That's what A is describing. B is like overlooking some other weird possibility. Who cares? It's just not going to devastate your argument like, like A is going to. Uh, C concludes that a generalization has been proven true merely on the grounds that it hasn't been proven false. Um, that is a common correct answer on LSAT logical reasoning flaw questions. They, they test this more and more recently. So make sure that you're familiar with this flaw. But the flaw that C is describing is when you say, um, you can't prove it false, therefore it's true. Or you made a bad argument for this, therefore I'm gonna prove the opposite of your bad argument or something like that. Now, yeah, sorry. Let me go with what I said first. They didn't say, uh, because you can't prove this thing false, therefore it must be true. They just didn't do that. That's what C is describing. They didn't do that this time. 
D, take something to be the cause of a reduction when it could have been an effect of that reduction. Uh, you know, that's like saying, um, huh, taking a cause for an effect. Oh, so reversal of cause and effect. So like if you say uh, cancer and cigarette is, is ca cancer and smoking is correlated, therefore cancer must cause smoking. That's a dumb argument because you're taking what could be a cause of cancer smoking as an effect of uh, cancer. No, confusing cause and effect. I know what that flaw looks like. Again, very commonly the correct answer. They just didn't do that this time. E does not consider the possibility that PCBs have detrimental effects on human health several years after exposure. Um, I guess they didn't take that into account, but why does that matter? I mean, their younger subjects didn't even have really the PCBs in their body. So they didn't consider this possibility, but I, I really don't see why it's relevant. And the thing about their sample size is hugely relevant. The answer was obviously meant to be A. I think they wrote this one to be kind of predictable. If you were reading carefully, if you're reading critically, you might've known this answer before you ever even looked at the question. Test 78, section one, question 23, a spy fails by being caught. Uh, I mean, that's one way that they could fail, right? That's a pretty spectacular flame out way that they could fail. What if they just never got any valuable information? Isn't that also a fail? But anyway, you're telling me that they fail by being caught, which yeah, I can surely see how that is a failure. And it is normally only through being caught that spies reveal their methods. Oh, so if they're successful, you're never gonna learn how they did it. Oh, but the successful spy is never caught. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm starting to get a little worried that you're gonna do some weird circular reasoning. That already just started for a second like it was gonna be circular. Um, so the available data are skewed. One can learn a lot about what makes a spy fail, but very little about what makes a spy succeed. Oh, okay. Well, you know, that actually sounds kind of reasonable to me. If, if the successful spy is never caught, and if it's normally only through being caught that spies reveal their methods, then yeah, you're never going to hear from a successful spy. You're only going to hear from a shitty spy. Or you're, I guess you're rarely going to hear from a successful spy. And I, I could see how, since when they're caught, spies reveal their methods under torture. Um, when that happens, then uh, yeah, you learn a lot about what makes a shitty spy. Huh. Which one of the following arguments is most similar in its reasoning to the argument above? I can make an LSAT an LSAT analogy, I think. An LSAT student fails by missing questions. It's normally only through missing questions that LSAT students learn from their mistakes. The successful LSAT student never misses questions. That's a high standard. I'm a successful LSAT student and I miss questions. Same with Eric, same with Abigail. But anyway, to continue, they say, one can learn a lot about what makes an LSAT student fail, but little about what makes them succeed. And yeah, I mean, I, it kind of like, I can feel that as sort of parallel, right? Like you, you learn less from the ones you get right. And the mistakes, you know, those always get flagged and you can always go and learn from your mistakes, but it's harder to learn from the ones you get right. So it's harder to learn why we're right than it is to learn why we're wrong. That actually really kind of makes sense. Which one of the following arguments is most similar in its reasoning to the argument above? So I think I have a pretty good idea what I'm looking for. A, of those who participated in the marathon, some succeeded and others failed. 
But those who did not participate at all, neither succeeded nor failed, since both success and failure require participation. I read that and I go, that's nice. I don't see how that's at all similar to this whole thing about like you only learn from bad spies. I just don't see anything there to recommend A. And thankfully I can see that hardly anybody picks that. B, people who are aware of their motives can articulate them, but unconscious motives are usually impossible to acknowledge. Oh, so you're gonna say it's easier to learn about our conscious motives than our unconscious motives? So people are more likely to hear about other people's conscious motives than their unconscious ones. Yeah, I feel that. I feel the click, I feel how it's similar. I mean, your unconscious motives are unconscious. You don't even know you have them. So you, they're usually impossible to acknowledge like a spy who never gets caught. You don't learn about the spy who never gets caught. You don't learn about your unconscious motives. You do learn about the spy who gets caught. So you learn about the, the conscious motives. Yeah, yeah, I like B a lot. C, it's unclear whether the company's venture succeeded because the criteria for its success are undefined. You know, I might just let go of that right there. How is that similar at all? But if the venture had had a measurable goal, then it would have been possible to judge its success. Okay. I guess I'd have to hear a case for C to, to really try to disprove it. You know, I don't, I'm not in the habit of like working hard to make answers correct. I know going in that 80% of answers are wrong. So when I read uh, A and it just seems like there's nothing there to recommend it, I go next. And when I, and then I find something I really like. I read C again, I see nothing there to recommend it. And I'm not trying to prove it's wrong. I just, I know it's wrong 80% of the time. So it's like, next. D, a teacher is someone who teaches. Okay. In addition, there are people who are who teach but are not called teachers. Wait a second. That'd be like a spy is someone who spies, but there are people who spy who aren't called spies. And they didn't do anything like that. So how can D be correct? E, because someone intervened in the conflict, the effects of that intervention can be discerned. But since no one can investigate what doesn't happen, it's impossible to discern <laughs> what would have happened had someone not intervened. But every time someone doesn't intervene, we do learn what happens without the intervention. I mean, I have an objection to E, but I just don't think it's a similar objection. I, wait, and, and in fact, I don't, I don't, I didn't really want an objection, did I? I mean, the given argument seemed to make a lot of sense. A also seems to make a lot of sense. Or sorry, not, not A, B. B seems to make a lot of sense. So the given argument makes sense. B seems to make sense in a very similar way. E, I have this objection to. And if I have an objection, then it's pro just probably not the correct answer. Um, And and I loved B. So yeah, that's enough for me to just say next answer is B. So Jen. Hey, um, so I ended up picking E, which I know is wrong, but to me, E seemed close, like the conclusion seemed to match the arguments, like strength of the conclusion rather than B was like most likely or more likely. Did I no. just read that? I don't think the conclusion matches though. It's funny how often people try to match the conclusion. It, it's like a shortcut that they learned somewhere where, oh, I, I know that on parallel reasoning questions, the conclusion has to match. So without really understanding the given argument or maybe without understanding E, the correct answer, you try to just match the conclusion. And people think that there are these superficial matches, but the conclusion of the given argument was the available data are skewed. Specifically, they're skewed in the spy world because you can learn a lot about spy failures. You, you don't learn a lot about spy successes. E is talking about a single incident. So rather than saying the data are skewed, you can learn a lot about this, but you, you, you learn less about this other thing. E is like, in this one instance, it's impossible to discern what would have happened had someone not intervened which I guess I have to give them credit for that. Like that seems obvious. If someone did in fact intervene, then we really don't know what would have happened without an intervention. We could speculate, but we can't know for sure. So maybe the problem with E is that it's like 
actually locked in. In that interpretation, it's like, well, you can't you can't argue with that at all. Well, that doesn't really make it wrong, though. I think the thing that makes E, another thing that makes E wrong is that it's about a single incident instead of a broader conclusion about generally one learns less about what makes spies fail than what makes spies succeed. Is that at all helpful, Sojin? Yeah, that helps. I think when you said the E is just one, one single point of data. Yeah. I'm gonna take a peek at the written explanation. E, so for E, our written explanation says, the conclusion in this answer choice is wrong. In the passage, the conclusion is that we can only learn very little about successful spies, not that it's impossible to learn. Conclusion says it's impossible. Um, Eric, Abigail, you know, it does seem like E might be additionally wrong because it's about a single incident instead of like a broader kind of a conclusion. So just take a peek at that um, and maybe you're gonna wanna edit that. Last one. Thanks for being here. Thanks for staying over time. Test 78, section one, question 24. Families with underage children make up much of the population, but because only adults can vote, Lawmakers in democracies pay too little attention to the interests of these families. Are you arguing for making all children be able to vote or what do you want to do? Give the parents their vote? What's your proposal here? Cause like, I, I feel around the corner, you're like, thus let's let, let, let's let toddlers vote. Is that what you're going to say? To remedy this, parents should be given additional votes to cast on behalf of their underage children. Yeah, I'm going to have to say I disagree. <laughs> um, if that were true, then you could just get more votes by having more kids. That'd be weird, wouldn't it? Um, maybe that's already what political parties try to do. <laughs> it's just that you don't get that vote for 18 years. Um But they say families with underage children would would thus receive fair representation. Uh, the argument requires assuming which one of the following principles. So it's a must be true question. Uh, it's a necessary assumption question, which is a must be true question. Which one of these do they have to agree with? There's no way they could possibly disagree with one of these statements. And again, their conclusion is it would be fair, uh, we would remedy the problem about lawmakers and democracies paying too little attention to the interests of families with children, underage children. We can remedy this by giving additional votes for parents to cast on behalf of their underage children. My objection as someone with no kids is, you know, fuck that, that's definitely not fair to people who don't have kids. You're gonna make it so that my vote counts less than someone who has 10 kids. Uh, you know, that doesn't seem good to me. Um, families with underage children would thus receive fair representation. And I go, well, that sounds like over-representation. That doesn't sound like fair representation. So they have to agree that A, the amount of attention that lawmakers give to a group's interests should be directly proportional to the number of voters in that group uh no because if that were the rule then it already is fair because we define voters as 18 or over the parents are already voters so if a is the law then we don't want to give vote all a wouldn't make us do anything i guess about this proposal because if we define kids as voters then yeah a still makes it directly proportional to the number of voters in the group but if we if we followed this plan, we would actually be calling kids not voters, and then we would be giving some voters, parents, more votes, which would then not be directly proportional to people who don't have kids. So yeah, A is exactly wrong. Uh, B, parents should not be given responsibility for making a decision on their child's behalf unless their child is not mature enough to decide wisely. They never presented evidence that kids are not mature enough to decide wisely. 
I mean, and you know, we all probably say, well, obviously a two-year-old is not mature enough to decide widely, wisely, but what about a 16-year-old? What about a 17-year-old? And anyway, they just, yeah, they want to give parents some responsibility for making decisions on their child's behalf. I don't think they want any caveat. They just want, if you're underage, give more votes to the parents. I don't see how they have to agree with uh, B. C, the parents of underage children should always consider the best interests of their children when they vote. So C would be used to tell parents, hey, you really should think about your kids when you cast your votes. But that's not necessarily what this speaker wants. This speaker wants parents to have a bigger vote. That might be because they wanna try to vote in their own best interest. You know, they want representation for families with children, but they never said anything about actually representing the interests of those kids. D, it's not fair for lawmakers to favor the interests of people who have the vote over the interests of people who do not have the vote. That would be like, you know, it's not fair for lawmakers to do things in favor of people with the vote and not not for kids or something. What's that have to do with their proposal of adding votes for people with kids? I, I, I don't think, oh, D is also about what lawmakers do, not about what voters do or how many votes individual voters should have. They don't have to agree with anything about what lawmakers do. E, a group of people can be fairly represented in a democracy, even if some members of that group vote <laughs> of that group can vote on behalf of other others in that group. Well, yeah, they have to agree with that because that's their plan. They want to give parents the right to vote on behalf of their kids, and they think that this is going to be fair. So yeah, they have to agree that a group of people can be fairly represented, even if some members of the group can vote on behalf of others in that group. Uh, yeah, must be true. That's the answer for this necessary assumption question. It's, it's E. Wow, that was a lot. Anna. Hi, um, I struggle with these types of questions a lot, and I'm wondering if the reason is maybe staying within the purview of the main noun. Like, is it that, because I I couldn't decide between C and D and E, or like I had a lot of them that I couldn't tell, and I was wondering maybe if it was like, like you were saying about lawmakers, like, don't click a question if it's not the same noun that's talked about in the section. Well, the same if, same subject. It could be a different noun. Oh, yeah. Same because subject. Same Sorry. Exist. But the yeah, the same subject. D is about the behavior of lawmakers. Why do they have to agree with anything about the behavior of lawmakers? You see it, Hannah? I do, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, my cat jumped on the computer, so I yep. turned the camera off, but thank you. That's okay. Uh, anybody else? Questions? Eric, am I missing anything? Uh, Julianne. Hi, Nathan. Um, I just had a quick question about the way that a group is defined in E. So I, th I initially eliminated E because in my head I was thinking about groups as like adults, First, like the parents versus the children, but the I guess the group is defined as the families with children. Well, you get to define it. I mean, it says a group. So can a family with children be a group? Yes. Or can our country, where you're trying to apply this policy, can that be a group like us? I mean, whatever democracy you're talking about, is that a group? Can, can it be a group? Sure. So then you can't eliminate E on those grounds. Got it. Feel it? Yep. Thank you. One of the answers has to be right. We do look for, for ways that answers can be wrong, but one of these answers has to be interpreted in such a way that you can say, well, yeah, they have to agree that a group of people like this group of people that we are talking about right now, they have to agree that that group of people can be fairly represented in a democracy, even if some members vote on behalf of others in the group. Because if not, then, you know, that's out. I mean, if not, your plan is not fair anymore. And you're saying it's fair. So yeah, they 100% have to agree with E 
if you interpret group in that way. And you don't have any justification for interpreting group in any other way that would then make E wrong, right? Because one of the answers has to be right. One critical takeaway from this class is that the right answers are 100% right and the wrong answers are 100% wrong. But sometimes that does mean that you have to read an answer in such a way that you can interpret it as being 100% right. Sean, I absolutely can't imagine parents advocating for voting on behalf of their children and, and not voting in their interests. Yeah, that is, I mean, it's kind of funny to imagine, but it's not that hard to imagine. All right, I'm going to take us off the record right there.